Good morning. This lecture is about women in the first few centuries of the Christian church. Um, so we'll start with some biblical women, and then we'll move through the first few centuries into some women whose names are less well known. So um, within the Gospels, there are several prominent women. Uh, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, who are host to Jesus when he visits Jerusalem. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and various other primarily unnamed women in the Gospels. Um, within the book of Acts, we have um, actually, uh, let me just mention that in addition to the, to the women that are named in the Gospels, there is a statement in Luke that says there's quite a group of people traveling with Jesus, including women. So I'll just read that. It's in Luke chapter 8 at the beginning. It says, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. So illnesses or um, disabilities of various kinds. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod, steward, Chusa. Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. So we have this record of a group of women traveling around with Jesus and supporting his ministry and learning and taking part, just as the disciples did. When we get to the book of Acts, we also have statements like that, that mention uh, that women are present as the, Christ as the followers of Jesus are meeting in the first few months after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So um, we have um, in Acts chapter um, 2 the statement that uh, both your sons and your daughters shall prophesy so that women are participating in the day of Pentecost as well as men. This is in a description of the day of Pentecost. In chapter 1, we have a list of the various disciples who are staying together and waiting for the Holy Spirit to come or that Jesus had promised when Jesus was taken up into heaven. But we also get in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Acts, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women. So the disciples, the male disciples are listed and then women, including Mary the mother of Jesus as well as his brothers. So we have these little footnotes throughout the text that yes, there are women present. Uh, the women whose names we know from the book of Acts are Sapphira, who along with her husband is struck down dead for perhaps not being honest with the group of Christians about their property. Um, we have Phoebe, who is, um, I'm sorry, she's the book of um, Romans. She's mentioned in the book of Romans. At the end, she's mentioned as a deacon. In the book of Acts, we have Priscilla mentioned as a teacher. We have, um, Lydia mentioned as a prominent businesswoman in Philippi in whose home Paul stays for about two years. So here's actually a book about Lydia. Um, it's historical fiction by uh, Mar Mary Therese Casey. And um, she's gone to a lot of research and used her imagination to try to figure out uh, what the life of Lydia was like beyond the several lines listed in the book of Acts. So we have these few women known by name. We also have the four daughters of Philip who are prophets. We don't know too much about them. Uh, the other way that we know about specific women by name is when Paul or someone else writing a letter to a church mentions people and includes women in the list of people that he mentions. So for instance, at the end of the book of Romans, the letter to the church in Rome, wh which Paul hasn't yet visited, He's planning to visit them. He's sending a letter ahead of time. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Centuria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints. 
and help her in whatever she may require of you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. So here we have a woman with very high status in the church. Um, she's a saint, a sanctified person in Jesus, made holy in Jesus. She's working and needing some uh, resources or people to assist her. She has been a benefactor. She has been a hostess of Paul and others. So uh, he also says, greet Prisca and Aquila. So Prisca is this another name of Priscilla, the one who was uh, teaching Apollos in the book of Acts. He says, Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. And then he mentions other people, including Mary, who has worked very hard among you. We don't know which Mary this is. Uh, Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles. Uh, later on, we have greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Uh, greet the mother of Rufus. Greet Julia. Greet Nereus and his sister. So it's evident that among the communities of Christians in various cities throughout the Mediterranean, um, such as Rome, uh, there are quite a few prominent women who Paul finds it important to mention by name when he's writing a letter, not just, and also the women, but people who are mentioned by name. Among this particular list at the end of Romans, it's interesting that Phoebe is called a deacon, and that's the actual Greek, diakonos. Uh, in the King James translation, if you look up Romans 16, chapter 1, you'll find Phoebe a servant of the church. So it doesn't sound like she's very important. Uh, but the word minister and the word deacon actually mean workers, servants. Um, so it's interesting that when a man's name is connected with deacon, in the King James it's translated deacon as an office or an important role. Uh, but when it's a woman, in the instance of Phoebe, she's a servant. So um, we actually have some churches today who don't allow women to be deacons. Um, if they looked at their Greek and translated correctly, they would know that women should be deacons because Phoebe was a deacon. Um, I believe the Roman Catholic Church is one of the churches that says women can't be deacons because in that community, the deacon is the first step toward becoming a priest. And uh, they're not convinced that women should be priests. Um, let's also look at the line of... Um, Junia, so greet Andronicus and Junia, they are prominent among the apostles. Well, um, early translators of the Bible were puzzled by this. How could Junia be mentioned as an apostle? Clearly a female name. So what happened was that they started adding an S to the name and making it a masculine name, although there's no other Junius really recorded in any Greek texts. So they're using the, the parallel of Andrea, Andreas, Junia, Junius, and they're just transforming it into a male name without any real evidence that, that there was such a thing as a male named Junius. But people felt that it had to be male because these two people are called prominent among the apostles, and how could a woman be an apostle? Well, these are the um, problems that have crept into translations of the Bible that refuse to take these letters of Paul at their face value that Phoebe is a deacon, an important role in the church. She's got a whole little paragraph, two verses dedicated to her, that uh, Junia is an apostle. An apostle means sent out, uh, those who are sent out with the good news of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and of him reuniting humans with their creator. Um, so, we have various women mentioned by name and at the ends of the other letters, but let's now turn to uh, women who are post-biblical, so they're working among the community of Christians, but um, after the time when the actual first Gospels and letters were written, so after the first century. Um, 
and actually um, looking in the first century, we need to mention Mary Magdalene along with these other figures. Um, so we've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, increasingly being honored. We've got Mary Magdalene with her um, legendary reputation of having traveled throughout the Mediterranean as an apostle. And the Eastern churches honor her as a great missionary and preacher. But um, the Western churches tend to conflate her name with a sinner woman in a previous chapter in the book of Luke. So. Um, Anyway, um, she is definitely a leader among the early apostles. Uh, if we go about a hundred years later, um, we have records of Perpetua. So uh, in North Africa, in Carthage, um, some Christians are arrested for, Christians at this time, 200 years after uh, the initial birth and life of Jesus are being arrested and persecuted as causing trouble within the Roman Empire and causing trouble uh, in two ways. One by stirring up uh, disputes that cause riots and another which is there's evidence of that described in Acts I believe chapter 21 in Ephesus uh, we have a description of a riot uh, that Paul is trying to calm down. And also the problem with Christians is that they're not worshiping the Roman gods. And if you don't honor the gods that are protecting and defending your city and your empire, bad things could happen. So in the case of Perpetua and her servant Felicitas and a few others, uh, including some men, they are arrested and charged with not worshiping, with refusing to sacrifice to the gods. And um, they have an opportunity at that point to either say, yes, that's true, and, and accept a penalty, a prison sentence, and a very often death penalty. Or they have the opportunity to say, no, I do honor the gods. I'm going to go ahead and, and make a sacrifice. So there's a division within the church at this time. Should you? make sacrifices to the gods because after all they aren't real or should you um, stand up for your faith in a way that uh, you actually lose your life for it. Perpetua was determined to stand up for her faith and do that. So let's um, learn a little bit more about her from the life and death of Perpetua that was written after she died. So this is a very early document um, we learn in this, this account of her life that she's from a noble family, the Vibii in Carthage. Um, she's married, she's a mother with a young baby, and um, she has two brothers, and um, she's arrested with two slaves and two other new Christians who are men. And She's the highest ranking socially among that group that is arrested, and sh therefore she is the best target for the government to say, okay, you do the right thing, you make a sacrifice to the gods, and she's the one who refuses. What's fascinating about her story is that we have um, a report of her father urging her to go ahead and do the sacrifice and live and be released and take care of her baby and her refusing to do it. Um, see if I can read a couple of these lines. Um, she says, um, I cannot call myself anything but a Christian um, and her father says to her, please um, respect your family and respect the life of your baby and and go ahead and make the sacrifice but she refuses she's um, she's standing up for who she is which is very unusual for a Roman woman to take a stance outside of the will of her father or husband and to defend it with her life um, so this is a 
a fascinating account. Um, while she's in prison and the debate over what to do with her is taking place, she has a vision of her younger brother in heaven, a little boy who died at the age of seven. She has some other visions and people are writing down her visions and um, she is gaining a very high status as being close to God and about to give her life as Jesus Christ did, so following in the steps of Jesus. After she is killed and the others, her life is reported. When a Christian gives up their life for the church, for Jesus, they are known as a martyr or a sign. And she is a martyr, one of the first martyrs. Um, you can pray to someone who has died and is already with Jesus. You can ask them to um, help you in your trials and in your life. So she attains a very high status as someone to be prayed to, someone who can actually help your own salvation. So she, like, like a priest on earth, holds the keys of uh, heaven, heaven and hell, as, as is mentioned when Jesus is speaking to Peter. So, very high status for Perpetua. Um, another interesting woman is Thecla, and of her we don't have historical records. We don't know exactly when she died or if she lived. She's um, recorded in legends and is known as someone who traveled with Paul and was preaching and be doing missionary work, traveling from city to city, city and introducing people to Jesus Christ and to his life and death. Um, among the unusual events in her story are that she wasn't yet baptized and just before her death at the hands of authorities baptizes herself. So um, this story becomes very popular as evidence that women should be allowed to baptize and to do some of the priestly roles. Um, but um, there are also others who say, no, women can't do this. Women should be in the home. Women should not be traveling, should not be celibate and um, out on the road. So we have a debate among the early Christians. Um, another name that we know is uh, Saint Macrina. Now we're going as up to the fourth century. This is the century when we have Bishop Gregory of Nyssa, Saint Basil, those are her brothers, and and St. Macrina, who died in 379 of the Common Era. She's well-educated like her brothers, raised in a noble family that faced persecution as Christians for four generations. So they are fourth-generation Christians. She founded a religious community for women in Greece. So she's an active leader in the church along with her brothers. Um, another interesting woman is St. Paula, in the same century, the fourth century. Uh, she's a member of the intellectual and spiritual community around St. Jerome. St. Jerome is a translator and commentator on Christian scripture. And um, she was born in Rome. She made a pilgrimage to sites in the Holy Land and, a, and to Egypt and eventually moved to the Holy Land and joined a monastic community in Bethlehem formed around St. Jerome. Her granddaughter, Paula the Younger, also came to Bethlehem and followed in her footsteps. So these women that we have recorded are women of the upper classes. So uh, Perpetua is upper class, Paula, Macrina. Um, if they're women of, of financial um, standing and education, their lives are likely to be recorded and they're likely to be remembered. We don't have a record of all the countless unnamed Christian women who were working in churches in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Philippi, in Alexandria. Uh, we don't know as much about them. However, we have records that are um, archaeological records. So I'd like to point out a map which is produced by Dorothy Irvin. Um, she's a leader of, of Christian women in Texas and a Catholic. 
and uh, she has studied all the various um, archaeological sites as well as early manuscripts, and she's compiled a map which puts a, a marker on every spot where there's a, a gravestone to a woman or a um, mention of a woman in a document as a leader in the church. And so I'd just like to point out that on this map there are there are markers for deacons, women who are deacons in Spain, in um, Apollonia, Egypt, in near Jerusalem, Sophia, in also the fourth century, definitely in various parts of Turkey, no, then known as Asia. In Cappadocia, there's a woman named Maria, who's a deacon in Timothea in Cilicia, which is now part of Turkey. Balisisa uh, is the name of a woman near Iconium. Olympias near Constantinople, uh, now Istanbul. Um, so, all kinds, and Phoebe, of course, is, is listed in Corinth. Then there, she also makes a note of various places where a woman is noted as priest. So she puts on her map Epicto um, in Thera, which is part of Greece. She puts Kale in Sicily. Um, she has several women mentioned in Salona, Italy, Flavia Vitalia, and unnamed. So these are primarily gravestones that, that have the word presbytera. So I'll just show you a couple of these. Um, here's one that, uh, here's a, Here's a gravestone that says, Tombstone of Bishop Alexandra of Rome. So we have a picture of a woman with her head covered, with her hands upraised, and it says, Alexandra Bishop um, uh, lived over 30 years and was, ra and was deposited or buried in peace. And then it gives the date that she was buried. So 15 days before the Calends of August, she was buried. So um, there are these, um, these mentions of women, and this is one of the most exciting because she's actually called bishop. But there, there are others where we have the word presbytera or priest. So if you, look, if you uh, look up Dorothy Irvin and you look up this map, or if you look at other maps, you'll find all these records of women um, having leadership roles in the church. Um, another place where you can find information about this is the book called When Women Were Priests by Karen Torgerson. So she's a historian of the first few centuries of Christianity and she has studied and collected information on women and their roles in the early church. When we left off with looking at gender politics in the, the letters of Paul, we noticed that there are some places where women are fully equal, as in Galatians 3.28, there is neither male nor female among you. Everybody should be one and made new in Christ Jesus. But there are other passages where there are statements, such as in the letters of Timothy, where the church says, be silent. I don't allow a woman to have authority over a man. So we have a record in the letters of Paul of gender politics, of some of the Christians saying, we're new in Christ, the, the second coming of Jesus will be soon, and gender roles, gender restrictions are, are no longer important. We have other Christians saying, we need to preserve propriety in order to live good lives and have a good impact in our society and win more converts. So um, among the various Christians, and there's quite a few varieties of Christians, those are two main positions taken um, to women, in regard to women. Um, as we look at modern, the area of modern Turkey, um, there's a mention of a movement called Montanism um, in the mid-2nd century. And there are two leaders, Montanus and two women, prophets, Maximilla and Priscilla. Probably a, this is, would be a later Priscilla if it's 2nd century, named for the earlier Priscilla. 
Um, and in this group, women have more prominent roles than in many other parts of Christian communities in the, in the Mediterranean. So we're not exactly sure what Montanism was, uh, but there are many statements against it. Um, it had apocalyptic beliefs, many predictions of war and other disasters. There were also predictions about the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem to be at a specific place in Asia Minor. Um, so this is taking off from the book of Revelations. Uh, there's definitely a focus on the end times among Montanists. And because of this focus on the end times, there's a sense that living in our, our actual physical bodies in our lifetimes is less important. So we find abstinence more commonly practiced among Montanists, both abstinence from foods and abstinence from um, marriage and from sexual activity, active lives. So when we have this situation of people giving up marriage, giving up childbearing, um, and honoring virginity. Then we have women also playing significant leadership roles because they are freer. They're not preoccupied and, and burdened with the heavy work of bearing children and raising a family. So we find among the Montanists quite a few women leaders. Um, two Christian writers where we find out about the Montanists from whom we find out about the Montanists are Epiphanius in the fourth century who opposes them and he considers them heretics. He also opposes women being priests. So that's actually evidence for us that some women are priests. If you have someone in the fourth century saying, no, we can't have any women priests. Well, they wouldn't be saying that if it wasn't something that was happening. Tertullian in the third century is another person who mentions Montanism, is opposed to it, and also to Gnosticism, and he's opposed to women being priests and women performing baptism. So his dates are actually the year 160 through the year 240. He's living in North Africa, and um, he actually later became part of Montanism, uh, and he became an advocate of going ahead and accepting martyrdom rather than um, doing some formality of satisfying worship of the gods in order to save one's life. Tertullian is also famous for um, a, a vituperative speech against women saying, women, you are all Eve, you are the gate of evil, you are the cause for all the evil in the world today. So that's one of his claims to fame. But He's opposed to Montanism, and he's opposed to women being priests and performing baptism. So um, that tells us that, that women are doing these things. Uh, we also find um, a mention of Epiphanius mentioning a group of Christian women in Arabia who came from Greece, and he calls them Coliridians. And he says that these particular women are involved in worship of Mary, the mother of Jesus, including baking cakes for her, that they're influenced by the cult of Sibylle and goddess worship. And he says the other problem with this group of whip Christian women in Arabia is that they're being priests. So um, at this point, let's just introduce the subject of heresy. Um, Heresy is a belief or a system of beliefs that differs in important ways from the mainstream of a religion. So in regard to Christianity, a belief that Jesus was not God would be heresy. A belief that um, Jesus had never really fully been human would be another kind of heresy. Um, the belief that Jesus did not rise from the dead would be a heresy. But uh, in this group, the heresy that Epiphanius objects to is too much honoring of Mary, the mother of Jesus, so to the extent of worshiping her, which is going to be a phenomenon that crops up again and again over the centuries. Um, so there are, there are authors who say that 
whenever you have heretics, you have women having more roles, more active leadership roles. So, um, in fact, there's a statement that uh, actually uh, Ross Shepard Kramer in this book, Her Share of the Blessings, goes to the extent of, of kind of joking and saying that when you read these people like Tertullian and Epiphanius um, or Jerome, she says, Jerome, it seems, was of the opinion that behind every heretical man was a heretical woman. So um, women have been associated with heresy. Um, there are two ways that this happens. One is Christians are following Jesus in the best way they can, and they're allowing women wider roles, leadership roles, roles of, of um, being priest, deacon, bishop. And because women are doing these things, another group of Christians is calling them heresy. Another way that women can be associated with the problem for Christians of heresy is that some sort of heresy is happening and they're noticing that women are more prominent in it, in that group of people. So this is a phenomenon we notice in the first few centuries of the church. Um, let's turn now to um, evidence that we have for women being leaders in the first few century. So we have specific women such as Perpetua. We have legends such as Thecla. We have all these archaeological grave sites and church dedications and um, things such as um, mosaics with women raised uh, performing leadership and worship with raised hands in the mosaics. So we have archaeological evidence. We have the evidence of people who are saying, no, don't let women be priests. That tells us that women are being priests. We have the actual records of the lives of some women, such as, as um, uh, Maximilla and Priscilla in the Montanist movement, such as Perpetua in Northern Africa, such as this group of women in Arabia. Um, and we also have um, people outside of the church who are commenting on the Christian movement and are commenting on what women are allowed to do and aren't allowed to do. So uh, these are the ways we find out about what women are doing in the first several centuries of the Christian movement. Um, and basically the things that I've told you are just the tip of the iceberg. There's, um, there's a lot you can study about the women who are surrounding Jerome and studying and learning with him. There's a lot you can read about in the accusations of Epiphanius and of Tertullian. And um, you can study Montanism and learn more about how women were active in that group. Or you can study the, the group of women in, uh, in Arabia and what the accusations about what they are doing and their leadership roles. So what we basically find is that throughout the Mediterranean, there is evidence of women having a large role within the first few centuries of Christianity. Um, the question then becomes, for women today, why isn't this more widely known? Why, why won't churches who refuse to allow women to be priests or pastors, such as the Baptist Church or the Roman Catholic Church, why won't they look at this historical record and acknowledge uh, the roles of women then and what women could be doing now? Uh, that's a really good question, and it probably comes down to men holding on to power and wanting to maintain their status and just not being open to the Holy Spirit's teaching and the leadership of the Holy Spirit for allowing women to do what God has called them to do. At this point, I'd like to point out uh, a recent documentary about women in the Catholic Church called Pink Smoke Over the Vatican. So this is a document about Roman Catholic women who are now being ordained as priests outside of the approval of the main branch of the Catholic Church. So these, these women are uh, one group among several groups, several branches of modern Catholicism that are going ahead and ordaining women 
and looking back at the time of the first few centuries and saying women had active roles then, um, saying with the title of Karen Torgerson's book, when women were priests, why aren't pri women priests now? And so they're going back and um, expanding women's roles today based on the greater knowledge that we have of women's roles in the first few centuries.